This morning's reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Machpat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph. And dropping down to verse 31, the son of Maria, the son of Mena, the son of Metatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse. And dropping down to verse 36, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxa, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. May God bless the reading of his word. There are several companies now where you can take a swab of the inside of your mouth and send it to them, and they'll analyze it and send you information about your genealogy. How many of you are interested in that kind of thing? How many of you have done that kind of thing? Yeah, a few of you. Um, both of my sisters, who are older than I am, did that back a few years ago and uh, you know, found out, oh, we've got you know, a fourth cousin in Australia or something like that. Uh, they had my parents do it, who are in their late 80s at the time. My dad's recently turned 90 had them do it, um, just to sort of find out more. My parents, that's not kind of their thing, but they went along with it. Um, I think we all chipped in, the kids chipped in to, to cover the cost of it. And uh, again, there was nothing really surprising in any of that. My, my parents sort of know their ancestry, where they came from at least, their, their ancestors from, from the United Kingdom. Um, but it's becoming very, very common and popular to both trace one's genealogy, uh, you know, with the family trees and all of that stuff. When it comes to the family trees, I'm the sap. Um, but it's also becoming very, very uh, economical to also do one's not only uh, genealogy, but one's biology, one's genetics. And so you can learn about, you know, those fourth cousins in Australia, or the, uh, um, you know, that you might be predis predisposed to some particular disease or something, which, which might actually be beneficial for you to, to monitor going forward. I, it's, it's neat to do that kind of stuff. You can learn some interesting things. One of my great-great-grandfathers uh, uh, was a sea captain. And so during the 1800s, he sailed uh, to many parts of the world. And when he was 80, he was visiting his son uh, out in Edmonton, somewhere out west like that. Uh, this was in the 1940s when, when my great-great-grandfather was, was 80. And on his 80th birthday, his son arranged for him to go up in a two-seater plane uh, one of those biplanes, and do the loop-de-loop -loop, uh, at the age of 80. Uh, maybe it was on his bucket list, I don't know. We talked about that a few weeks ago. That same great-grandfather lived to be 102, I think it was, and at the age of 100, he was still chopping his own firewood. And so it's, it can be very interesting uh, to do a little digging and learn uh, more about your, your ancestors and the family tree, and there's always sort of the, the, the bad branch of the family, you know, the people that, uh, you know, uh, were up to things they shouldn't have been or maybe doing some time for things they, they should have been doing time for. We all have those kinds of, of branches of our family that are not bearing very good fruit. And so here we have, in Luke's Gospel, Luke records how uh, John the Baptist was baptizing out in the wilderness and people were coming to him from all over to confess their sins and to repent and to be baptized in those waters of baptism in the Jordan River, and how Jesus came and was baptized by John. And upon coming up out of the water and praying, the Holy Spirit came to Jesus in the form of a dove, and a voice said, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then Luke immediately begins to list out Jesus' genealogy, 
although he admits this isn't actually Jesus, it's Joseph's genealogy, Jesus' supposed father. And he goes back all through the generations. And this is a passage I've never preached on before because I didn't want to have to read those names. <laughs> and I didn't want to have anybody else read all those names. But, but the middle of last week, I was thinking, well, Collins offered to do the Bible reading. <laughs> Although I went easy on him because we left out vast verses. We, we skipped ahead quite a bit uh, and just sort of touched on some of the verses with, with names that we would be familiar with. People like King David and uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of course Adam uh, going all the way back that far. And so I went easy on you, Colin, and you're welcome. Um, <laughs> But I've, I've, I've never preached on this passage before because uh, I wasn't sure why Luke would include it. Um, even though we, we love Jesus and we want to know Jesus, when we get to this passage of, of the genealogy, you know, our eyes glaze over. Uh, it's not interesting to us. How many of you have had this experience? You're, you've gone to somebody else's house, and, and you're maybe sitting having tea or something, and you look over and there's all these pictures of family members on the wall. And you say, oh, you've got a beautiful family. And then the person gets up and they say, these are my grandparents, Edith and John, and they were married in 1893, and, and they moved to Alberta, and this was, was their family, and, and they go on and on and on of people you will never meet, you won't remember their names, and it, it's just the most boring thing in the world. Um, how many of you can relate to having had an experience like that? Yeah. In Newfoundland, I, where I was a minister my first three years, I would often make that mistake. And, and we, you know, the person would take 20, 30 minutes introducing me to all these relatives that I would never meet. It's boring. Why, why would Luke include such boring? Boring content in this gospel, this good news about Jesus Christ. That's a question. Now, if it's our own family, that's a little more interesting. If we're, you know, doing some research, if we're investigating, if we're finding clues, when we, you know, get another date or, or find out about one more relative and we're able to add them into the, the family tree and make that connection, it, it can be a bit, you know, rewarding. There's a sense of achievement, a sense of accomplishment. There's one more person or one more date. And, and when it's our own family, that, that can be exciting. And so it was really neat to find out that, uh, that uh, our, our new Sunday school coordinator, coordinator, Andrea, is a second cousin once removed to Rick, Rick Graham. And so I asked Rick, you know, do you have any more relatives we should be hiring? <laughs> second cousins once removed. How exciting is that? Oh, that is neat. Genealogy was just as important to the Jews of Jesus' day as it is to many people today. The Jews kept very faithful and diligent records. They kept them not just amongst their family members, but they were stored in the public accounting and, and you know, offices, just like you know, the government keeps track of all of us. For the Jews, their ancestry was very important because they knew that God had made promises to their forefather Abraham that Abraham's descendants would be blessed, would be God's chosen people. And so it was very important for them to be able to trace their lineage back to Abraham, especially important for the priests who had to show that they were of the tribe of Levi in order to serve as priests. For some, they got all wrapped up in this. And so when John the Baptist was out in the Jordan River in the desert and people were coming to hear him, coming to, to see this prophet proclaiming the kingdom of God, some Sadducees and Pharisees of the Jews went out as well. John had very different words for them than he did for the ordinary average people who were coming to confess their sins, to repent, to be baptized as a demonstration of entering into that repentance. John the Baptist called these Sadducees and Pharisees a brood of vipers. 
snakes. They said, we don't need to confess our sins. We don't need to repent, for we have Abraham as our father. They were saying that because they were descendants of Abraham, because God had made a promise to Abraham and his descendants, that they had no need to repent, no need to confess their sins, no need to be baptized. And what did John the Baptist say? He said, God can turn these stones into children of Abraham. It's not about your biology. It's about your heart. Why was Jesus, genealogy, why did Luke go to that trouble of listing out Jesus' genealogy? Yes, he was baptized, and yes, the the Spirit came upon him, and the voice of God spoke to him, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But why all these names of people we've never heard of? Luke is showing us, in Jesus' baptism, in the Spirit descending upon Jesus, in the voice of his Heavenly Father, and in this genealogy, Luke is showing us where Jesus comes from, showing us who he is, showing us where he is going. And we would do well to recognize that we have a great heritage in the faith as well. It may not be a a genealogical one. We may not be able to trace our our ancestry back to to, those Jewish people of old. But we have a great ancestry Not in the flesh, but in the faith. We have been baptized. We have received the Spirit. And we hear the voice of God saying to us, You are my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. That says something about where we come from. About who we are. About where we're going. And we praise God for it. And so when... People looked to Abraham and said, Abraham was my forefather. And John says, it's not about your biological ancestors. God can turn these stones into children of Abraham. It's about where your heart is. The same is very true for us. We become children of God. We become members of the family of God. Not by our Genetics, not by our biology, not by our ancestry, but by our faith. Just as Abraham believed the promise that God made to him. And so it was counted to Abraham, that faith was counted to him as righteousness. And when we believe what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, his son, when we believe what God is doing in us here today, we too, in Jesus Christ, become members of the family and household of God by faith. And we give God all the thanks and praise for it. We become sisters and brothers of one another. Someone was telling me just recently about another church that they used to attend, and after worship, when people would go out into the the parking lot and get in their cars, It was like they had not just spent an hour worshiping and praising the Lord together as sisters and brothers. Everyone was in a hurry. Nobody allowed others to, you know, to drive out in front of them. It was just everyone for themselves. How sad that is. To have such an individualistic mindset. To go to church for what you can get out of it. To go to church out of some sense of duty or obligation. And and then when it's over, to just sort of want to get out of there as fast as possible. And they said to me, how wonderful it is here at Byron United, because out in the parking lot, as people are going to their cars, people are pulling out of their parking spaces, everyone is so friendly and patient and courteous and waving others ahead of them. Completely different. And I thank the Lord for that spirit of of fellowship, of friendship, of of love and generosity that that exists in this place, not just in the parking lot, but right here in this space as well. And I thank God for Andrea, 
and her ministry to the children and youth among us. I know that a lot of us find it very difficult to relate to people who are perhaps much younger than us or much older than us. We don't understand their, their generation. We don't understand their, their thought patterns. We don't understand their behavior. And I think it helps to realize that all of the people within our church family are our sisters and our brothers. The little children who are up here this morning, the teenagers down in their classroom, we're all sisters and brothers together. And we can relate to one another as family. If you're on the younger side and you have trouble relating to the, the, the 80 and 90 year olds, it's the same thing. Let it sink into your heart that these people are your sisters and brothers. Love them, listen to them. Strike up a conversation with them. And you'll find, find that sense of unity and love and, and that bond of peace and joy that we share in the Lord. As uh, we greeted each other this morning, I encouraged you to call each other, you know, Brother Rick and, and so on and so forth, realizing that there are many Christian communities where they do that all the time. And we can think of, of the Catholic, you know, nuns uh, who are sisters and, and the monks who are brothers. And I think of the, the Christian ashram. We had a, a Christian ashram event here last summer where everyone is encouraged to, to use those terms sister and brother when they speak to each other. Reminding us that we are all sisters and brothers, a part of the family of God, regardless of our age, regardless of our economics, our education, how long we've been a part of the family, doesn't matter. We are sisters and brothers in Christ. And that's why uh, we like to invite people several times a year to become members of our church family, to say, this is a church home for me where I, I want to belong. Yes, I believe, and yes, I want to belong. And so again, if you're interested in that or have questions about that, feel free to speak to me. And so when you go home, I'm sure all of us have some pictures of our family up on the walls or uh, in frames on, on our end tables or coffee tables or on our desks. When you see those pictures of your own family, thank the Lord for them. But also let those pictures remind you of your bigger family. Not just here at Byron United Church, but your family throughout the world. Not those who are simply alive today, but all Christians, all believers of every generation. We have such a great ancestry, a great heritage, and we give all the thanks and the praise to the Lord for those faithful men and women down through the ages. And we emulate them. And we bless them, and we seek to be like them, and we seek to bless one another in that same spirit of love, unity, peace, and joy. We give thanks that we are called. We give thanks that we have faithfully responded to that call. And we give thanks that the Lord unites us in a love, a family, which lasts forever. Hallelujah. Amen.